And now I would like to introduce the, uh, the, the presenters. Uh, Lori, <clears throat> excuse me, Lori Bardell, Bardell is corporate counsel and has been with DuPont Legal for over 15 years. Lori supported Pioneer, DuPont's seed company, for over 10 years as a patent attorney, including participation in a Delaware Chancery Court mediation. She also worked on the divestiture of DuPont Pharma business and retained responsibility for the COZAR patent portfolio for some time after the sale. Thanks, Lori, for participating in the program today. Next is uh, Timothy, or Ty, Carson, who's counsel with Crowell Mooring's Washington, D.C. office. He's a member of the antitrust group and the e-discovery and information management group. Ty's antitrust practice focuses on the counseling and representation of clients in both litigations and transactions. He also has advised clients in connection with both grand jury and civil non-merger investigations. Thanks to Ty for participating today. And our third panelist is Chong S. Park. He is a partner in Steptoe's Washington office, where he is a member of the Antitrust and Competition Group. Chong's practice focuses on antitrust litigation, representation of clients in governmental investigations, and complex civil litigation. Thank you, Chong, as well, for participating. Panelists, the floor is now yours. Next slide, please. Hello, everyone. This is Chong Park. And I thought we'd uh, begin uh, by getting right into it. Uh, uh, the presentation is going to be structured in a couple parts. The first part, we're going to talk mostly about process and then get into some uh, nitty gritty with respect to uh, Ty's uh, primary presentation concerning uh, uh, the panelists' favorite topic, which are when bad documents happen to good people. but I'd like, in the first instance, to talk about uh, the process, and I'm assuming some knowledge of the antitrust laws, but uh, the typical danger zones, uh, the red zones, when counseling clients or in terms of actually providing training, uh, and I'm borrowing from the title of one of my favorite movies, but uh, also giving a tip of the hat to one of my most effective tactics in training um, folks is the fact that there is, in fact, criminal liability for antitrust violations. So in terms of the first danger zone, the first couple of points uh, I think are worth emphasizing is that horizontal agreements between competitors are extremely uh, dangerous and fraught with risk. And I think that's an area in which um, folks counseling clients can really uh, make a point in terms of getting their attention. Uh, as in uh, all legal discussions, such as one we're engaged in here, sometimes it's helpful to keep people awake. And that is an, a topic, criminal liability, uh, potentially going to jail, which definitely gives people uh, you know, pause. Now, as in the third bullet point, not all restraints of trade are, are as obvious as price fixing. Uh, stabilizing pricing, etc. Some of the vertical arrangements um, with respect to uh, activities that uh, parties take uh, part in, such as price discrimination or resale price maintenance, are, are complex. Um, and as I allude to in my last bullet point, there is some new activity with respect to the agencies and private litigation relating to enforcement of intellectual property, patents, et cetera, and as well as some increased scrutiny in terms of most favored nations' clauses in contracts. So clearly there are a lot of issues uh, that are potentially um, to raise antitrust risk. And, and to manage that risk, one objective of this presentation is to provide some pointers with respect to compliance training. Next slide, please. The approaches to compliance training range from basic to specialized training. And now, in terms of providing such training, whether to a small group or to a larger group, 
and this is primarily with respect to uh, in-house counsel, this is what I'm targeting to, but as, as outside counsel have also provided this training, uh, the first point I think is critical is that in order to have effective training, uh, you really do need buy-in from top management. You need to have the message go out that antitrust risk compliance training is important. Uh, as folks are you know, familiar with, uh, you know, mandatory training is not, whether it ranges from uh, HR training uh, to computer training, are not really high on folks' lists as an everyday opportunity or, or activity. But with respect to managing risk and, and potential liability to a company, um, antitrust training, I think, is critical. And it requires uh, some uh, consideration with respect to how you're going to get the message across, to what audience, what the presenters are, and the topics. And while general antitrust um, training is important, you know, we need to make sure that in fact, um, training is done appropriately because, you know, frankly, whether it's private litigation or, or government investigations, uh, and as a former regulator uh, with the FTC, I can tell you that uh, the fact of whether or not training is going on or not uh, is something uh, that's, you know, put into consideration. But in terms of the specifics and the pointers, I can tell you from my experience that you know, companies, uh, and uh, whether small or large, need to basically consider a, a tailored approach um, and a, a hybrid of mixing the actual substantive law, and as you know, antitrust law is very complex, versus the process of how to actually manage, identify, and um, resolve potential disputes or risks. And as I, a couple of my favorite approaches that I put are the scared straight and teaching them to catch fish approaches. Uh, the scared straight approach is uh, pretty self-explanatory, and that is where you make a point, as I alluded to, to the fact that there is some serious consequences that are attached to antitrust liability. Uh, the teaching them to catch fish approach is, I think, appropriate as well, but that's to enable uh, stakeholders within a company, uh, within an organization, to identify on, uh, by themselves potential risks and to elevate them to the appropriate level of consideration, whether it's in-house counsel or uh, up the chain. Um, and I will tell you that the scared straight approach is uh, effective, especially with I think senior executives who have responsibility and decision-making authority in that um, I often joke that uh, that orange is a fall color and some people are not fall colors and orange, which happens to be the color of uh, oftentimes prison jumpsuits, uh, don't particularly look good on folks. And that, that happens to uh, catch people's attention, but the probably one consideration that folks need to take into account is how much time you have to actually conduct a compliance session in figuring out which particular approach or which blend of approaches to use. Now, in terms of a practical pointer for compliance training, I often find it's helpful, and, and some of my clients have, in fact, used literal takeaways for antitrust compliance training. I know a couple companies that actually have flashcards that on one side or the other have do's and don'ts with respect to communications and interactions with competitors, other companies, suppliers, distributors, and customers, uh, and as well as some uh, companies I know have antitrust hotline numbers uh, that are different from the regular extensions for in-house counsel. Uh, whereby, you know, there are um, an opportunity to reach out. Now, uh, for those in-house counsel on the line, it's probably not recommended to give folks your cell phone numbers, but uh, some avenue uh, by which the questions can be elevated uh, is often helpful. And, uh, Lori, I don't know if you had specific um, 
instances or uh, um, examples of that, but. Um, Sure, Chong. I have a couple of things to add. Um, certainly, buy-in from top management is critical for our compliance program. Um, and I think your point regarding time is also a good one. That is, um, take the opportunities for training when they present themselves. Hopefully, they are an extreme example. But as you're in leadership team meetings with your client or other situations, depending on what the audience is, you can certainly take that moment to deliver a short training session then if something is being discussed that may have occurred or um, they're looking at potential opportunities, as well as building in time um, in certain talks or certain opportunities with your client to cover certain topics if you haven't had the um, issue come up, which would be a good thing, of course. Um, in addition, at DuPont, we, um, of course, law is critical, but in view of our core values and ethics, we certainly also look at those when considering potential horizontal agreements. And um, you know, as you pointed out, with the kind of lit litigation on the rise, this kind of litigation on the rise, um, we certainly also wish to avoid any appearance of impropriety. I think that's, that's uh, really appropriate. And I think if, uh, sort of a practical point here, as I counsel clients as well, is, uh, you know, Getting involved in antitrust litigation or investigation, whether or not at the end of the day uh, you think uh, it, if the conduct doesn't you know, meet all the particular elements of the Sherman Act, etc., it, it uh, is an incredible um, diversion of resources, not only uh, you know, money and legal expenses, but actually time and opportunity costs. Um, so why don't we go to the next slide? So as a practical matter, um, uh, I, I like to use what are called minesweeper questions uh, when confronted with uh, a particular issue or a problem. And a minesweeper questions are essentially questions that really sort of go to the heart of, um, of the issue. Because oftentimes, uh, you may be confronted with a complicated fact pattern and scenario, depending on the industry. Uh, but uh, as I tell my clients, I put on my uh, regulator, FTC prosecutor hat, and sort of cross-examined them and essentially asked questions as we have on the slide in terms of, you know, what is the actual reason for this agreement, this conduct, and what sort of effects do you think that this conduct will have? And I've actually listed on this slide, uh, but of apparently, uh, obviously, protecting the innocent, some questions, some actual answers I've gotten to my questions, um, and to block competition, uh, to stabilize prices, to flex our muscle and use our market power, and the, the last part of that was to make them buy our product X. So, um, as you might imagine, those answers resulted in some detailed discussions uh, with respect to you know, what was really going on and whether or not the conduct was, in fact, uh, appropriate. And uh, I, you know, I think we all have war stories about that, but I think the practical message of this is, at the end of the day, where I like to start is at the end, which is what is the effect on competition, on competitors or consumers, uh, which informs and, and why exactly is a particular party trying to do what they are proposing. And if the answers um, raise the hair on the back of your neck, then that's sort of an indication that, you know, some more investigation is merited. And it's a, it's a you know, regardless of how complicated the particular fact pattern is or how sophisticated the arrangement is if the net effect is to somehow adversely affect competitors and competition uh, and there are no real pro-competitive justifications, then I think uh, it clearly that merits some more discussions because you're facing a situation where the antitrust risk may be uh, being ramped up uh, in a way that uh, there must be some 
um, you know, more discussions about that. And so why don't we go to the next slide? Uh, and as I said before, part of that is in terms of who your audience is. And I know, you know, from this, the panelists have discussed this, and this is a non-exhaustive list. But um, for purpose of this discussion, I'd like to highlight three particular groups of people uh, that I've had personal experience with. And uh, for any sales and marketing folks out there, the pleasers and the schmoozers, that's not meant in a pejorative sense because that's in the sales and marketing team's job description. I have found, however, both on the private side and in government, that sales and marketing people, uh, for some reason, love to use the phrase dominate within three of market. Um, and you know, it, it is in the job description of sales and marketing folks to obviously um, make a company um, look good, seem to have a presence in the market. However, and you know, as we'll uh, discuss later in Ty's presentation, you know, emails or presentations, uh, marketing documents, sales documents that uh, have particular language in it may come back to bite the company when they're faced with potential um, antitrust uh, scrutiny. Uh, the second uh, group of people that uh, are, they're mentioning are science and technical people. Uh, and unlike uh, the first group that may tend to try to um, color things in a more, uh, I say, colorful fashion. The fact in data shares, as I call them, have uh, sort of the opposite problem is that they actually like to share accurate and precise data and information. And in certain instances, uh, such as standard setting organizations, uh, technical working groups, um, such sharing might not, not only have IP issues and trade secret issues, but down the road, if there's any issue later about a company's enforcement of their IP rights and then patents, that potential sharing or that actual sharing uh, may come, uh, again, to haunt a particular company. The last group, uh, which I term the wild cards uh, because they're unpredictable, but also have, as in a card game, have, may have a considerable effect on the outcome are the senior executives. Uh, and those are, uh, in my experience, uh, senior executives uh, have perhaps the ability to wreak the most havoc, but also are, in some instances, at least in my experience, um, not easily trained or, uh, or advised, frankly. But uh, you know, that's always a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, Lori, uh, do you have a similar experience? I do, and um, I'll take them in reverse order. So with senior executives or director level um, executives, you certainly need to have your elevator speech ready, right? You have a short amount of time, um, or they, are, they have busy schedules, and you certainly want to deliver the message succinctly and um, to the point. Um, but communication skills are key. As lawyers, we talk to a variety of different people. Um, so at, to your point, um, you need to have different presentations or different topics ready for each of these different types of um, people. And that's because of their jobs and because of their risk profiles. So who they're exposed to and the types of um, work they perform are different. So um, you know, how your message is delivered and what the message is will be different. And at, at one point, those senior executives have heard those other messages, um, regardless of what the, whether they've been with the company for years or with different companies. But um, you would think that they've heard those other messages in the different settings, and now they need to hear what's applicable to their situation. So uh, why don't we go to the next slide? And so uh, in terms of the sales and marketing teams, Lori, do you have any particular um, uh, points uh, to emphasize uh, with respect to uh, what's on the page or additional points that we've put down on the slide? So sales and marketing, the first thing that comes to mind is price announcements. They're always trying to get the price announcement out. Um, and I would um, caution you know, whether to have a public announcement or a direct-to-customer announcement. Um, 
that's that's one way to look at it. Um, we are frequently told that if uh, announcements are necessary because they are customers need to notify their own customers about why prices are increasing. Um, so that's certainly something to, to keep in mind and um, just be careful with the general rule of thumb, of course. It certainly depends on a lot of different circumstances um, for what business you're advising. Right. And, and, and to your point previously, uh, Lori, in my experience, the sales and marketing teams and personnel uh, of companies have potentially the most points of exposure to customers, competitors, and actually also others within a particular organization. And so the document creation training for them is particularly important. Yes, and particularly with regard to drafts of documents and um, emails and, you know, uh, documents certainly include and run the gamut of a variety of different uh, types of documents. So, right. So uh, the next slide, please. Now, in, in terms of sort of technical teams as, as a scientist, and um, I can tell you from working on a variety of, of standard setting and IP slash antitrust interface cases that you know this is a this is an arena and a set of personnel that um, I think need more training than they have historically received. Uh, as as I mentioned, there seems to be more scrutiny now in terms of uh, companies and the enforcement of intellectual property, and with the technical people. Uh, they're not, uh, and uh, you know, uh, particularly, shall we say, uh, versed in uh, antitrust risk or legal requirements, etc. A lot of them uh, look askance when uh, asked to come in and talk to lawyers. Um, I often feel like I'm the grim reaper walking into a conference room, uh, but I think it's important because. In, a, in, a, in addition with IP counsel, um, training on trade secrets, et cetera, and protection, there are antitrust concerns that come in and that may not uh, raise their head until some time in the future. But I think it's important for technical teams, especially when they're involved in standard setting procedures or anything with respect to uh, products that or technology that is being developed in conjunction with other companies in a collaborative process that uh, training uh, be given and this may be a much more a smaller group but nonetheless um, you know technical and scientific team training I think is um, something that uh, folks should consider. Lori thoughts? Yes I, I agree with this of course um, certainly Participation in standard setting groups um, should be carefully monitored. Counsel um, should be consulted, um, particularly where you have patent or IP rights held by company setting standards. Um, and of course, as you pointed out, these, this uh, may happen in trade association settings. Um, you know, if you're in a um, prepping for a transaction and your client asks you, or, excuse me, if you ask the client. Um, if uh, the transaction may include trade secrets of theirs and they ask you why, <laughs> you certainly need to take a segue into some IP law and uh, call in your IP attorney or, or you know, make sure they have some guidance on that. We certainly want to protect trade secrets uh, and have others that we're working with protect them as well as we do. Uh, next slide, please. And as we were talking about before, as Lori mentioned, in terms of having your elevator speech ready, uh, I think one particular group, senior executives, director level uh, folks, uh, have limited time, obviously, um, and are very busy. Sometimes it's hard to get on their schedule. But I think it's critical uh, to have some sort of training. Again, one size does not fit all. And it might be that you catch as catch can, or if there's any sort of leadership uh, sort of meetings where you can get a, a, some time. Uh, but I think it's important because uh, in my experience, um, you know, formerly with the FTC and then uh, on the private side, some of the most damaging documents, unfortunately, tend to be created by uh, senior executives. And they may be 
taken out of context. Uh, they, can, they may not mean what they actually say, uh, but as we'll discuss later, it's, it, it's very hard um, to argue around that. And having uh, seen them and used documents at trial uh, in front of a jury uh, and in front of a, a, a judge, uh, sort of the wild card created documents are, are very, very troublesome. And so I think that it's critical for folks advising clients uh, or uh, in-house counsel that they get in buy-in from top, not only for compliance training for uh, the groups we talked about or, or general compliance training, but buy-in for their own training. Um, what's been your experience, Lori, in terms of in terms of that process? That's right. You, um, you certainly, from the back end, um, we have compliance um, auditing, and auditing might include looking at email um, for uh, a list of uh, emails from particular folks um, in a business, and looking for certain keywords. Um, it would it may include uh, reviewing trade association memberships. Um, um, as we pointed out earlier, what not to write proper and careful communications, um, and um, examples of things that we may have found in emails. And um, of course, then that somewhat comes full circle. You can certainly use that at the front end and front load um, any planned meetings uh, which may be occurring um, with examples of what you found in the past for a particular business. Um, we would also ask for um, an agenda for any planned meetings, um, participant names and titles from both uh, companies when we have competitor meetings. Um, but in terms specifically of uh, senior executives um, where some of these meetings occur, um, make them part of the process by um, potentially or drafting an email for them. Um, of course, they could um, make it their own with um, language that they're comfortable with after, and then you could review that as well. And they could send that out to um, employees in that business um, as a reminder. It could be once or twice a year, quarterly. It certainly depends on um, the nuances of your business. Um, but it's certainly something you want to engage them in and get their buy-in and, and deliver the message with you to show the significance. Yeah, and I, I, I agree that it's, uh, it's something that uh, needs to take some time. The, my one practice pointer is that with senior executives, especially for outside counsel or people not um, actually within the company, and, and Lori, your, your position is different than I am because you're part of the team. I'm sort of an outside uh, mercenary who's sometimes viewed as a grim reaper coming in from the outside, but in terms of the sort of specific training for uh, uh, C-level executives, it's really important to gain their trust and to give them an understanding that you're you're trying to help the company um, basically, you know, conduct itself appropriately as it should, and and to ensure that you know down the line, um, you know, they the the time spent with outside counsel is minimized. And so that's your yes. goal. Yeah, uh, and certainly those those um, clients of ours who have been deposed in the past, um, certainly those should be minimal, but they seem to be the best behaved. Um, and uh, their good dog and pony shows are those ones where you bring them with you to deliver the message and explain how things are uh, maybe taken out of context and what you meant at the time you wrote it may not be... Um, what it means five or ten years later. Great. Uh, so on this next slide, uh, you know, there's not enough time, even in this uh, particular presentation, to go through in detail uh, some of the emerging issues. But I did want to touch upon them uh, to provide people a flavor in terms of sort of trends right now to help folks uh, sort of spot the issues. Uh, for more detailed review. The first one is, is, as we've mentioned before, an increasing focus on intellectual property and antitrust. Uh, there has been, for example, cases and uh, investigations relating to uh, you know, whether or not uh, a standard essential patent is being for, enforced in an anti-competitive way and you know, what the effects are with respect to certain IP and in merger context as well, 
what happens to particular patents and whether or not they have effect in terms of blocking innovation in particular technology markets. But I think um, you know clearly, given the you know uh, the way competition policy is evolving and the way there's there's more high technology even now and more innovation, that there's going to be more fights about intellectual property and then more um, disputes that focus on this intersection between intellectual property and antitrust. Uh, similarly, um, there's been some more scrutiny in terms of the health care. And a lot of these topics seem to overlap. There was a Supreme Court case I'm sure people are aware of in a patent settlement uh, context with respect to pharmaceuticals. Uh, hospitals, hospital contracts have been scrutinized with respect to exclusive dealing, um, agreement, MFNs, most favored nations provisions. There's a government a lawsuit against Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan with respect to you know, a, 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 an agreement to provide most favored nations um, status and sort of penalizing other uh, potential parties and hospitals. Um, so increasingly, and whether or not it's the government looking at these issues or private plaintiffs, uh, you know, folks need to be sort of sensitized that uh, there are, you know, more and more uh, antitrust and competition issues arising. Uh, I think uh, government enforcement is rising. I think private private uh, plaintiffs are rising. But you know, most importantly, as Lori alluded to, um, for those who are advising companies, you know, not only managing risk, but you know, ensuring that the companies adhere to their own code of ethics and behavior, I think, is, is becoming increasingly important. And we see a lot of clients who, and I think appropriately so, um, make the decision that you know, we want to make sure that we comply appropriately with all applicable laws, regulations, and that we conduct ourselves appropriately in business. And I think that's something that's become a, a, a trend, which is why we're having this uh, webinar, uh, because there's a need out there for, for training. Laurie? Yes, and I think that's true. We've certainly seen examples of a pay-for-delay situation with pharmaceutical companies agreements with generic manufacturers um, where they may delay introduction of the generic product. Um, that I think that's a whole, <laughs> can potentially be a whole separate webinar. Um, but I also understand there, there are at least two cases recently where that involving um, patent rights and um, royalties related to um, those uh, agreements where patents may have expired in certain circumstances. I, I understand one includes um, Samsung. Um, can you elaborate on those, Chung? Sure. Well, there are a couple, of, and I think what, Laura, you're talking about are cases where I alluded to in the standard setting process where for a particular, uh, where companies come together and set forth a standard by which a particular product uh, or device will be manufactured. And then later on, a company says, oh, to the extent that this, uh, you know, this product is conforming to a particular standard, you know, we actually have a patent that covers that. And so if it's a standard essential patent which covers a particular standard, then anything that is manufactured, made, used, or sold that conforms to that standard is subject to royalties under our, our patent. Now, a lot of these standard setting organizations have what are called FRAND, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory policies whereby if you are going to participate, and this is why training of technical and scientific folks is so important, that if you're going to participate, then you may need either under the policy of the particular organization need to disclose the particular intellectual property that is at issue and may potentially impact the development of the standard or provide assurance that if this particular standard is adopted that you as a company 
will um, license your patents or IP on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory basis. Now, oftentimes, though, the folks that are involved in these organizations are different than the people who are actually um, basically prosecuting the IP and in, in charge of enforcing it. Uh, and so there may be a disconnect within the company. But in terms of the broader point, in terms of there is now more disputes in terms of whether or not uh, companies are abiding uh, either by uh, their um, assurance to license on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, or whether or not they have properly disclosed their intellectual property during the standard setting process. And so that is uh, an increased um, you know, risk that uh, folks and companies that are involved in standard setting or in terms of intellectual property development uh, need to contend with. Um, uh, next slide, please. And, and, Ch and Chong, this sounds to me like this is exactly the reason why you need tailored compliance training for the technical people, because that's an issue that is a very hot topic um, and is becoming a big challenge, but it's, it's not really your garden variety antitrust issues that those of us that have just a, a general understanding um, might be sensitized to. So. Right. It just reinforces that point that you know part, all of the trainings need to be uh, carefully tailored to the different audiences. Yeah, and the one, as we said, one size does not fit all, and and in this case as well, it may be something that's uh, delayed or a ticking time bomb that's waiting there and may go off later down uh, after some passage of years or after the IP is actually um, enforced in some fashion. Absolutely. Uh, so this slide is called Back to the Future, and it's just to uh, sort of uh, to allude to certain um, you know fundamental things that still seem to arise. One is obviously agreements with competitors. That's always going to be a a risk uh, you know factor, or, or any agreements that companies have with competitors are always subject to some sort of scrutiny. Uh, so that will be um, horizontal behavior and, and agreements that will never sort of go away. The one issue I did want to flag, though, is resale price maintenance, which is there was a Supreme Court case uh, several years ago in which the per se rule for uh, minimum resale pricing went out the window, and there was, uh, it was now in what's called the real of reason land. But the one reason I wanted to uh, flag that uh, for folks who deal with uh, vertical relationships is it's still an unclear field and that there are state laws that, uh, in several states that are at odds with the federal approach. And so I just wanted to flag that because that is an issue which, you know, potentially is complicated and it's not necessarily a uh, cut and dried uh, issue. Uh, and, and I wanted to flag it because I recently, in the last year or so, I've been getting a lot of questions on situations related to that and clients are surprised that, you know, the state some states' uh, approach to that is different from the federal approach. But, uh, but to the first point, I mean, uh, I'll be honest, in my experience, the biggest risk and the biggest danger has always been in terms of um, situations where you're dealing directly with competitors, and uh, it is an area where um, you know, there's there's always going to be um, you know um, a real uh, you know real danger, all pun intended, of stepping into this red zone or, or danger zone. And with that, um, you know, and I, I you know I beat that into clients, and when I do compliance training, uh, I, I beat that uh, to death, uh, along with this topic that I'm going to hand off to Ty. Uh, that the risks there are amplified if you you somehow find yourself amidst the sea of bad documents. Thanks, Chong. Um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit now and uh, talk about something that is uh, sort of an overarching issue in any antitrust compliance program. 
Um, and that is that it, it's document creation. It sounds uh, fairly simple, but this is a, um, an issue that is becoming increasingly um, at the forefront, mostly because we live in a world where documents are becoming more and more pervasive, especially in their electronic form. And um, no matter what the antitrust issue is that you face, whether it's uh, an illegal agreement with a competitor or fighting a monopolization charge, if you're trying to justify a discriminatory price or even trying to get the government to clear an M&A transaction in a concentrated market, almost always documents are going to be at issue in either uh, the prosecution or the defense of that. Um, and with the pervasiveness of electronic communication and the increasingly cheap storage of it, um, companies, for lack of a better word, have become sort of pack rats. They have um, an enormous amount of material um, that while it may be difficult to sort through, um, government enforcers and plaintiff's lawyers are getting very good at honing in on that information, and it's become a very fertile ground to build an antitrust case. So um, with that, we're going to turn in this section to a discussion of some quotations that only the government could love, <laughs> That's, and frankly, that make antitrust lawyers cringe. Um, and hopefully what we're going to do is leave you with some guidance that helps manage this perennial problem. So in this slide, um, you can see that well, the point I like to make here is that you can hire the best economists and experts in the world to argue a particular act or transaction will not hurt consumers. And typically, the jury's eyes and maybe the judge's eyes also are going to glaze over when you start talking about economic evidence and how that um, helps or hurts the case. Um, and government enforcers and plaintiffs' attorneys know this, and they know that a layman jury member may not have an economics degree, but they're certainly going to understand or at least believe that consumers are getting a raw deal when presented with an email from a company executive saying something along the lines of, this business practice or this transaction will allow us to crush our competitors and raise prices. And that sounds fairly simplistic, but you know, all of us that have worked in this area can tell you that we see documents that are almost verbatim like that at times. Um, and uh, you sort of shake your head, but they pop up and even when they're not in sort of those blunt terms and they might be expressed in a more nuanced way, um, you just sort of shake your head and, and you realize that if, if we had compliance training in place that you can't really eliminate every problem, but you can start to get a hold of this and sensitize people to the problem um, and, and hopefully sort of uh, start to, to manage this pretty um, serious risk. So, you know, Lori, I realize that this can almost seem too obvious to, you know, the outside people who, count, who uh, spend their lives doing antitrust, but help me out here. Do business people usually get this without proper sensitivity training? Yeah, well, well, as I alluded to before, you know, those who get it most are those who have experienced it. And maybe that's why we, um, you know, uh, are the balancers of risk. We're, we, that's our job, and if that includes looking at a potential worst-case scenario because we've seen them. Um, unfortunately. Um, but this is uh, where the commercial attorney's role really, you know, is 180 degrees and looking at first, you know, compliance training at the beginning, um, but, you know, litigation support, maybe a potential business resolution could be found instead of litigation. Um, but then using those situations as teaching tools, so then we'll come full circle to your compliance training. And, uh, you know, what what's obvious to us unfortunately isn't always obvious to our clients, so we really need to be the communicators of, um, you know, what, what is the worst case scenario. Yeah, I think it's, it's our collective job to, you know, at a really high level just to, to make people start to, to think about these issues more. So um, we thought that providing a few recent real-life examples of cases where bad documents played a key role would be helpful. Um, and I'm going to talk about two in particular here. Um, the first one is a case that where DOJ challenged a company called Bazaar Voice and its acquisition of another company called Power Reviews. Um, and I'll give you, I'll give the online audience a few moments to read through the quotes that I, that we put up on the screen while I provide a little bit of background. Um, both Bazaar Voice and Power Reviews 
provide technology for online stores that customers um, use to rate products that they buy. So to sort of ground us, this is the, the kind of thing where if you were to go on Amazon.com or eBay or Hotels.com, um, you could provide like one out of five stars or three out of five stars and write a pro or negative review of the product that you buy. And there is a specialized software industry that, that uh, makes this, and it's, it's fairly concentrated. Um, there's only a couple of companies that do it. Um, these two companies would argue that there are more than a couple, but that's not really what we're here to talk about today. Um, but the thing, the, the issue here that makes this a, a little unique is that it was, power of use was small enough that Bizarre Voice's acquisition of it was not reportable to the government under the government's typical pre-merger review program. Um, so I think that what what you see here is, um, you know, a lot of communications that uh, business people either were not thinking would never get read, or um, antitrust lawyers never really had the opportunity to get in and sort of save them from themselves. And I'm not picking on the company, but um, you can sort of see in these quotes um, that uh, if antitrust lawyers were involved, that there could have been a little bit of uh, better ways to convey um, the, the rationale for the deal than what was conveyed. So um, after the acquisition, uh, it's clear that customers complained to the DOJ and the DOJ opened an investigation. <coughs> and, um, <coughs> excuse me. So what always happens in these cases is the government de demands production of a lot of documents and what they found was very damaging to say the least. Um, this is just sort of a sample of the damaging documents that were presented at trial. And anyone who wants to use, th these are good uh, types of quotes to use in compliance programs to train people on what is bad and then to sort of explain how uh, you might explain these deal rationales in, in a better way. If anyone wants to look at them, they're all on the DOJ's website. If you can't find them, if you email us, we'll make sure that you get the link to them if you want to use any of these, because I think real life examples are um, the most uh, powerful. And one of the reasons that I in particular really like um, these, these quotes is that they show some of the creative and colorful ways that people talk about so-called, you know, benefits of a deal that um, the DOJ or a, a plaintiff or, you know, a, a consumer who's hurt would say they're not benefits, they're, they're things that harm competition and harm customers. Um, and and they, these quotes are you know, some of them are almost cute <laughs> to antitrust lawyers. They make us cringe, and you can almost see how people think that they're writing these in clever ways. But um, you can see that the government picked these quotes out and used them at trial, um, and and they were able to find them in what was probably millions of documents that existed within a company, and 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 really focus on the most damaging material to to present at trial. Um, Turning to, so one thing I want to just mention about these in particular is these are sort of like executive level quotations in, in um, presentations that ordinarily would be fairly scrubbed of um, harmful material. They, they would have gone through, through careful vetting in many circumstances. Um, in this case, it, it did not seem to happen the way that we would ordinarily expect it. But you can also see that even chatter um, can be very damaging and the government can um, locate these bad documents that really aren't even in what would be the PowerPoint to the board of directors. Um, I like this example because this is an email chain. Um, and I haven't included the whole email chain, but essentially what's going on here is there are some high level executives that want to have a deal about this transaction that they're considering. And one guy wants to be allowed into the meeting, and he's saying that he has a perspective on the meeting. And it really has nothing to do with analyzing the transaction at all. It's just casual chatter. And But unfortunately, he says that because if we do this transaction, that 10 to 20 percent price erosion will disappear, meaning that we will essentially eliminate a competitor. We won't have to compete as hard. Um, we'll be able to keep prices high. And this is all in the midst of just your everyday sort of, um, you know, CEO kind of executive chatter that um, 
No one really thinks twice about this if they're not sensitized to issues, but this ends up in the complaint. It gets put in trial at DOJ, and, it, and it's, a very, it's very damaging, even though it's just chatter. So I think it's good to, in a compliance program to show it's not just the PowerPoints you present to the board. It's not just um, the notes that you make that the board may make in their um, notes during a presentation. It's the everyday chatter. And on this slide, you see that it even gets worse. Someone from outside of the company um, emails a CEO of one of the parties and sends an article about one of the other companies going public. I'm going to presume that that person doesn't even know that there's a transaction being considered. Um, and the response to this is saying, you know, we're not really worried about this. It's a good thing. And they say, because it's essentially a duopoly, and not even really commenting about the transaction, but commenting about the state of an of industry that they're operating in a way that suggests that it's not entirely competitive. And again, that ends up in DOJ's complaint um, to show that these are the two closest competitors, and their merger eliminates um, essentially all com competition in this industry. So, <clears throat> pardon me, I'll bring in a little bit under the weather today. So, uh, you know, when I read stuff like this, um, Lori in particular, we've, we've talked about this a couple of times and described this as the New York Times test. And I, <laughs> and I, and I think that's a, a helpful reminder, and I was hoping I could get your perspective on that. Sure, um, and for those of us who, can, uh, who are old enough to remember paper newspapers, and um, the above the fold, or I guess I can say um, with regard to e-newsletters um, or newspapers, you could see it on your screen. Um, would, would the person that you're talking to want to see their email, their quote, in the New York Times on the front page above the fold? That's my test. And are you embarrassed to see what you have written? Would you embarrass the company um, with what you've written? Um, so I think uh, these are good tests to remind people to check their writing, to be careful with what they're writing, and uh, be accurate and write factually, and don't stretch what you're saying. Um, and certainly, um, um, you know, go, having gone through uh, document collections in the past and, and seeing what some people are capable of, certainly um, with regard to litigation documents, um, you know, you, you don't want to make personal attacks ever um, or make personal statements regarding people. It, it's a distraction in litigation. Um, you, do, you really don't want to have to um, have that distraction or be accused of, you know, some other intent, and um, that's really not, uh, not necessary to even go there. Um, but I think the New York Times test is a good one. It, it uh, helps people check their writing, and uh, it's, a, it's a quick test. Yeah, for people before they write anything down. Absolutely, Lori. I think, you know, it's, it's just helpful to remind people that email is not really private anymore. Um, and and this, this case in particular shows that, you know, even the most casual chatter among your friends, your buddies in industry, um, ends up coming back in really very unexpected ways. I'm assuming that these people probably did not, um, could never have guessed that this degree of their email could have been aired out in public. And I mean, and this stuff is, you know, <laughs> tame compared to some of the other stuff that we see in our, uh, in our field. Um, but one thing that, you know, and as we go through this, uh, our audience today may be thinking, you know, we're not really worried about this because we don't do transactions. And I think that that's a fair point. But one of the noteworthy things about this particular type of chatter is that it really had nothing to do with a particular transaction, this, this last quote. And instead of merely, it merely described how concentrated a market was, which is something that, you know, really is never helpful to talk about from an antitrust perspective. This statement just as easily could have been used by a regulator to show um, market power in a case alleging that one of the companies was abusing a dominant position. I mean, that this, could, this same statement could be used in a variety of different um, antitrust actions. Which leads us to our, our next case that I want to highlight, just to show that this is not really an outlier. Um, this is an FTC case decided very recently. Um, 
McWing was a, it's a very recent, um, I mean, the FTC was looking again at a very concentrated industry. This time it was the industry um, that produces pipe fittings for municipal water supplies. I know this is very exciting stuff, but um, still good training material. <laughs> um, and there were lots of issues in this particular case, but for purposes of our discussion, um, the FTC challenged an exclusive dealing policy where the dominant provider of pipe fittings refused to provide pipe fittings to um, distributors if the distributors procured any pipe fittings from the dominant manufacturer's rivals. So it's essentially a foreclosure um, kind of case where um, a very powerful um, producer manufacturer was using its heft and its leverage um, to make sure that other smaller competitors really could not get a foothold. Um, we highlight this case because um, it's an exclusive dealing case and um, this is a, a common uh, vertical issue that um, we counsel clients on. Um, and the key consideration is often the market power of the defendant and whether the market is structured in a way where the defendant is able to foreclose other competitors from successfully competing. And in this type of inquiry, what the defendant intended, it really need not be front and center to prove a case. Um, the heart of this type of inquiry is usually whether competition could be harmed or whether it likely will or actually was harmed. And those are really economic questions um, for the most part among antitrust lawyers. But again, we see bad documents playing a very key role in the government's case and frankly making the government's case much easier than it otherwise would have been. And, if you, and it goes back to that same point that um, you can sort of you know, spend an eternity arguing over whether or not executives meant what they said or if what they said was even possible to come to fruition. Um, an executive or a sales team, they're often in a mode where they, um, their job is to puff up their, their company and to show how strong they are and how good they are at what they do. And this type of language that, is, that comes very, I think, naturally to that sort of, um, that person is the complete opposite of what you really want to see um, from an antitrust perspective. So um, we're not trying to, you know, completely <laughs> uh, um, make people ineffective or not powerful and competitive at what they do, but they just need to be conscious about the language they use. And I, um, I like this here, this, uh, this, these quotes that I've selected because they show intent and uh, language in a couple of different ways. You can see how it shows that the mission was to, of the business was essentially to um, protect domestic brands and market position, um, to make sure that our other competitors don't meet a critical mass. Um, and you force your uh, distributors to pick their horse, essentially meaning you're going to force them to pick us and they cannot use anyone else. And we can't support people who aren't um, using us exclusively and helping our competition to build a line against us. These kinds of quotes are um, they're sort of perfect things to put into an um, antitrust compliance training for, uh, for salespeople and people who are in charge of distribution because it, it helps them see how their, their natural language can sort of come back to bite them. Uh, and this is Chong. I, I can tell uh, you that as a former FTCer myself that uh, what Ty is saying is absolutely correct and, and we call them uh, within the agency quote unquote intent documents and uh, they are used uh, and given the, the state of electronic discovery and search terms, uh, any email that's even within uh, the realm of dealing with a subject may be discovered. So I think what Ty is saying uh, you know, bears specific emphasis, and these quotes are, are sort of representative of quotes we have. As, and when I was back in the agency, we used to see them all the time, unfortunately. Yes. And so this is, this is Lori and Chung um, and Ty. Certainly um, a one-off document may not be enough to you know, prove a case, of course, or show intent, but taken together with these other types of documents we've discussed, emails with certain language in it, um, you know, and price announcements that may be publicly uh, revealed, um, 
you know, so much um, in addition to those as well, so much information is now publicly available. Um, why make it easy for someone to connect dots? Um, you know, follow the law and be careful with how you're trying to communicate um, as a business. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. And I think you hit on another uh, point here is that you never really know what how people are going to put the language together. And this isn't just the enforcers that are going to do this. Um, you can have some customers who are going to save these emails. And I, I'm not sure exactly what happened here, but we know that when you send, when a company sends an email to a terminated distributor saying we can't support a distributor who's helping our competition build a line against us, the easiest thing for them to do is frankly to just forward that to the DOJ or the FTC <laughs> along with some other language that that shows that the industry may not be competitive. And then you've got, you know, customers who are, you know, they're, that's why that's why the agencies are there um, is for them. To, they've got hotlines for people to send this stuff to. So I, um, it's hard to ask executives to, to sort of anticipate how everything they can say can be put together, but I think it's important for them to at least be sensitive to the fact that that's how uh, this ends up playing out in many circumstances. So with those couple of cases and, and real life examples to just sort of ground us, um, we want to give the time that we have left some, some practical guidance. Um, and this, again, seems, uh, I think, somewhat common sense. But um, when you're thinking about a document creation and compliance program, it's, it's really important to make sure that you're considering all documents and how expansive the definition of document has um, become. Because in antitrust cases, like many others, um, it's no longer just collecting the hard copy files and the PowerPoint presentations. Um, the other side is going to ask for emails. They're going to look at your online databases. Um, they often are going to be requesting information that may not even reside you know, on your particular servers. They, they, social media has become a very um, hot area for discovery, one, because it's sort of easy often for the public to at least find out what's out there in the initial um, sense because, you know, a lot of this is, is public knowledge. Um, <clears throat> and, I, you know, Laurie, I think the, the social media aspect of this is, is becoming pretty key. And I was wondering from a compliance program perspective, how are you seeing social media addressed? It, it certainly is. I, I would think all multinational companies have such a policy. Um, there should be a person um, who authorizes employees to speak on behalf of the business or the, for the company. Um, they, in and of themselves, these particular platforms that you mentioned, um, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, for example, um, are part of an overall marketing and communica communication strategy. So um, you know, just sending out tweets or um, communications isn't enough. You really have to monitor conversations. Um, have it as part of your marketing plan to develop and publish the content and um, certainly analyze, you know, anything actionable, any communications you get back. So we do have um, a compliance program in place that I think we can um, talk about later in the slides. Good. So um, we said a lot. and. We were hoping to be able to sort of boil this down into, I like checklists, and I, a lot of our clients find them helpful. So we've come up with something that um, over time we sort of revised and, and uh, developed called the Ten Commandments of Document Creation and Retention. And I think it's helpful to just go through these, and hopefully they can be a takeaway that, that everyone can use in their own compliance program, or at least adapt to their own needs. Um, the first thing, obviously, is, you know, the best way not to have a bad document in your files is not to create one in the first place, and that's simplistic, but it goes to the point that if the more that you sensitize the business to these particular issues and have targeted trainings and um, reminders and um, programs that help people and hotlines and have an open door of communications to the legal department, um, you start to minimize uh, the existence of bad documents in the file in the first place. 
Um, thinking about documents expansively, um, emails and voicemails are not written down on paper, um, but they are considered documents nevertheless and are often producible. And the thing here is that in e as we become more, um, we start to communicate more online and start to use, even for business, things like social media, the, the communication becomes more casual. I mean, you say things that might seem like they're unjust or a joke, but you've always got to be thinking that, you know, these are no longer just social media has become almost a misnomer. It's really all about a lot of these are being used heavily in business now. Um, handwritten notes of meetings or other conversations or documents too, and they need not be kept if there isn't a specific reason to do so. I think for me in particular, I just have a habit of writing down things that people are talking to me, and there's a, there are some things that just don't need to be kept. Um, and for people who are engaging in um, areas that, while they may not be um, unlawful, but there is a level of risk there, Casual sorts of notes about them can be misinterpreted. So it's better, you know, if, if you don't need to write something down, not to do it. Um, on the flip side, you know, you have to be aware that these notes and documents, whether they're electronic or hard copy, um, they, if, even if you do create them, you need not keep them for a longer period of time if there is um, no reason to do that. And I think that's, again, where a document retention policy is a very good complement to a good antitrust compliance program. Moving ahead, um, so this sort of brings us back to talking about not just saying that the documents that we gave as examples are bad, but helping people to understand how to reconvey that information in a way that is positive, that is meant to show how competitive the industry is and how certain actions or transactions are designed to benefit competition and benefit consumers. And it really cannot be overstated how much of a difference it can make when you have a PowerPoint presentation about a transaction or some sort of commercial deal that you're presenting to executives to just take a moment and think, always ask, what does this do for customers and how is this going to benefit customers instead of saying how it's going to benefit the business? You often are able to convey the same things and have the same value proposition without using the bad language about raising prices and um, eliminating competition. You're saying on the flip side that you're making the product better for your customers. You're giving them more choice. You're this transaction or this uh, commercial activity will allow us to innovate and improve quality. Those are the things that you want to make sure are stressed in documents where you can. And obviously, this is the word that Chong mentioned at the very beginning. These are sort of like the very bad words to say in antitrust. We don't, <laughs> we don't talk about how we dominate the market, and it's always good to try to scrub those words from the language of the business people if possible. Um, another thing here is to help people in business. Um, if they spend a lot of time with antitrust lawyers, it's, they can sometimes have a tendency to start talking like them. I don't know why they would want to do that, but that sometimes happens. Um, and it's good to sensitize people and encourage them not to talk about competitive issues and let the lawyers do that where it will be protected by privilege. Um, and then. Finally, this is sort of more on the process side but and the document retention side, but you should always be reviewing your working files on an ongoing basis to prevent the buildup of unnecessary documents. Not only is it hard to explain a document five or ten years down the road, but the more that you keep, even if you're ultimately not found liable for a violation of the law, it costs so much money to, to mount a defense when you have to sift through millions of documents. Um, and and investigate so extensively to find out what documents really meant. Um, so a good document retention policy really goes a very long way um, in minimizing risk. And then obviously the, the last one is when in doubt, you know, have legal review the documents in advance. 
there, uh, Ty, I think it's um, significant to, um, as you pointed out, have a document retention policy so that um, you have a compliance program and in addition that um, you're complying with the program as well. You're, you're abiding by it. So I think that goes a long way. Absolutely. Yeah. A written well. policy that, that is consistently complied with is, um, helps give the company um, credibility and, 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 and it's much more defensible. And this is John. The one point that I'd like to emphasize that Ty mentioned is on the his point. I think is really well taken in terms of when you're presenting uh, the benefits of a particular agreement and how it helps customers and consumers, etc. You know that that is something that uh, you may want to encourage the business people to put in paper because oftentimes, as he mentioned, you have the crush the competitor sort of. This is we're going to beat the market. We're going to but the pro-competitive aspects, and from a, a purely litigation standpoint, if at the end of the day you're under investigation or in litigation, and you do a simple balancing and say, well, we've been through millions of pages of documents electronically, and we could find no um, pro-competitive justification that was actually documented on paper. Um, you know, that tells folks something about whether or not the justification you're offering then is in fact valid or not. Um, even though it might be, it just people just didn't happen to present it in that way in, in, in documentary form. So I, I just want to emphasize that point that Ty made. I think it's a very important one that, you know, in training you should be encouraging folks to say what's positive about a particular arrangement or agreement. And it goes back to the mind super question. If folks can't come up with that, then it's something that needs to be um, you know, investigate further. Thanks, Chong. I, yeah, I don't think that that can be emphasized enough, the contemporaneous documentation of the pro-competitive benefits. It's very hard to, to make your story if you're waiting until a challenge for the lawyers to make it for you. I mean, Chong, I'm sure you can tell when the lawyers are writing the document and not when the business people are writing the document. It's, I have to imagine that it's fairly transparent. So with that, um, our last sort of section on um, practical advice is another area that I think has um, become a bit more of a challenge because of technology, and it's uh, the risks of oversharing in online forums and collecting competitive intelligence. Um, another best practice of any antitrust compliance program is to address the, the low type, the low risk types, and the high risk types of gathering competitive intelligence. Um, this has become a, a much bigger issue as you know you move from in-person meetings to uh, meetings that essentially happen virtually. Um, you, the, the, the old sort of uh, vision that we get is a bunch of you know business people talking in a, in a back room but now we see uh, that there is an opportunity for mischief in online forums that are really very much out there in the open and because it's a casual forum, um, people can let their guard down if they're not really sensitized that this really needs to also be a part of their antitrust compliance program as well. Um, Lori, do you, do you have any insight from a business perspective how um, people are adapting to the challenge of, of online media and gathering competitive intelligence? Well, certainly, as I referenced earlier, um, DuPont's core values and ethics um, certainly govern uh, guiding principles that we have for competitive intelligence gathering. Um, just a simple example is um, if a business wants to do something, they certainly can't hire a, co a consultant to do something that the business itself can't do. So anyone, any consultant that the business hires would be guided by DuPont's core values and ethics as well, um, and of course, certainly the law. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot of uh, public information um, that's easily accessible to build any case, um, and trade association meetings um, seem to be fertile ground for investigations. Um, Ty, do you, do you um, have any guidance as to why these meetings might be uh, in the crosshairs? Yeah, the, I mean, okay. uh, trade associations provide uh, a wealth of um, pro-competitive uh, benefits to industry, and if structured properly, they can they can help uh, an industry become more efficient and save costs, and that ultimately benefits consumers. But on the flip side, 
um, you can't get around the fact that you are have a meeting among competitors, and it's an opportunity um, for people who would not normally be interacting so closely to get together, and, and they have to be easily managed. The atmosphere at a trade association meeting, um, unless very carefully managed, can seem almost sort of permissive, um, given that there's lots of perfectly legitimate discussions going on, and there's also often a a big socializing aspect to it. I mean, they're supposed to be fun. I mean, they, so, mm -hmm. and they can be, but um, in such an environment, it's easy to lose sight of the, the antitrust rules of the road. Um, and then, as business becomes increasingly global, you have, if you put in a couple of companies in the mix who are not familiar with U.S. style antitrust laws, then things can sort of go off the rails quickly. Um, when we, we, counsel people very heavily um, in, in trade association interaction, and there's a lot of ways that you can manage that risk, but um, one of the keys is that you, you help people uh, before they go into the meeting to know what they should and they shouldn't be talking about. Um, at the meeting, it's helpful to have placards out on the table that show um, these are how the meeting will be conducted in accordance with the, the antitrust laws, just to remind people. We often have counsel who attend these meetings to, to help people in case they have a question. Um, they can turn to counsel and know in real time whether or not it's permissible to talk about a subject, and, and we can intervene um, if necessary. We try to be quiet because that's <laughs> not what we're there to do, but it's, it's, it's valuable sometimes, especially if it's a, a high-risk interaction, to, to have counsel there as well. Yeah, and Ty and, and Lori, let me just interject that uh, several months ago, I actually was counsel at a trade association uh, executive sort of level meeting, and while I was quiet, I was in the back room, I, I threatened that I had my challenge flag, like in the NFL, and if I think uh, went out of line, I would throw it on the table. Um, and I didn't throw an actual flag, but I did uh, have to walk, physically walk, and sort of, you know, uh, make my presence known. But uh, that sort of... Um, protection, I think, is, is sometimes uh, warranted. Yeah, very valuable. I mean, we see uh, trade associations often discussion and complaints about horizontal agreement. So it, it's sort of a classic area um, to, to be mindful of. But I'm noticing that we're, we're getting ready to run up against our time, and I do want to leave a couple of minutes. So, <laughs> I wanted to sort of wrap up the presentation part with some compliance programs, um, some just some guidelines um, and some checklists um, for, for managing competitive intelligence and, and um, online interaction in the age of social media. And you can sort of think about these as, as three broad categories of, um, you know, in our canvassing and, and internal discussion to think about what's effective. Um, one is you've got to have policies and guidance. Um, you have to instill awareness throughout the company, not just a one-time um, training or an infrequent training, but you have to find opportunities to constantly remind people about these issues. And then uh, the last component is enforcement and monitoring of that policy. Um, as far as the policy and guidance portion of that, um, it's important to set ground rules for employees' participation in online forums, just like you would at a trade association meeting, um, and and help people understand that in social media, it's very easy to sort of blur the line between what is your personal comment and what is your comment as a result, as, as a representative of a company or organization. And you really have to always under assume that you're, you're speaking on behalf of the company because that's often going to be what someone who's challenging it is going to try to insinuate. So, for example, um, just like in uh, a trade association meeting or a standard setting, you know, meeting or just any sort of group interaction, you don't want to, you want to stay away from the, what we know as the core worst uh, antitrust issues. You don't talk about present or future prices. Um, business or strategic planning information, uh, specific customers, or, you know, dividing customers up or geographic areas. These are the classic uh, horizontal, um, you're getting into that area where you have the classic horizontal um, violations that have resulted in people going to jail. There. So, and the point here is that 
becoming an issue where it's easier to talk about these issues online, and you have to be have people sensitive to the fact that it's a new era of new media that these problems can occur. Um, Lori, I know you're familiar with some of the, the ground rules. Have, has there been specific guidance about, in your experience, you've seen businesses do this in a separate policy, or is it just getting wrapped into the overall policy? Well, I think I'd say it's a little bit of both. Um, certainly, um, it uh, must be chartered, um, both at the corporate level and um, through legal, and um, then is governed by two, again, um, two separate entities within DuPont. Um, we have a social media um, center of excellence as well as, uh, as I mentioned early, earlier, corporate marketing and sales as well. Um, we found it can certainly be um, a competitive intelligence tool. Um, you, businesses can um, obtain external input into their internal decision making um, and uh, also identify early warning uh, systems and potential changes to the market. Um, you know, can uh, fill, so you can find potential gaps, such as um, identifying blind spots of any of your competitors, um, and um, following emerging trends, any potential trends you see. Um, in addition, we have training and compliance, and um, we, as I said earlier, um, the, our business people need to obtain authorization to speak on DuPont's behalf. Um, and they must disclose that connection to DuPont when um, speaking in that capacity. Um, DuPont uh, contact information should also be provided um, upon request when they're um, you know, answering some online chat or communications. Um, and again, I'll go back to DuPont's um, uh, conduct and core values and ethics training. So that's uh, certainly a portion as well. Um, activities um, should not be conducted that are contrary to the code of conduct. And certainly, um, nothing illegal or offensive should be posted. And confidential information, of course, should be protected at all costs um, and not, uh, not revealed in um, social media settings. Um, if, uh, if an employee is looking at the personal use of social media, they should make that very clear that it's their opinion alone and that it doesn't um, reflect the views or positions of DuPont. And again, um, in that kind of setting, they should not reveal uh, confidential uh, company information. I think that um, what we're seeing is there are a lot of ways to sort of crack this nut, and that it's not simply the antitrust policy that we might already have in place, that these sorts of issues are sort of, they touch different parts of the company and different functions within the company. And depending on a particular company circumstances, um, you may have portions of this policy that would live in different areas, not just the antitrust. There's a human resources component. There's an IT component when you have social media and, and the business's network involved, certainly the ethics program. So there's a lot of ways to um, sort of ingrain this uh, within the, the culture of the company to minimize risk. And then we'll just wrap up um, with uh, how you – some ways to ensure compliance with the policy and guidance. And there has to be a monitoring component. We talked a little bit earlier about how you can audit. Um, there are outside companies that specialize in, in doing this um, and helping people uh, monitor the online presence of, of the company, whether it be in social media or to – um, help them look at their internal systems to see if there are red flags popping up about certain patterns of communication. And it sounds a little big brotherish, but it often helps people stay on the right side of the line. Um, and then I think just, you know, it's part of this is just because I also live in uh, the e-discovery world when I'm not doing antitrust work, but I don't think it can be overemphasized that a document retention policy um, really is a very strong complement to a good antitrust compliance program because it allows you to minimize documents out there that can be misconstrued and, um, frankly, to minimize the amount of material out there that's no longer valuable and um, that can be very expensive and time-consuming to consist with if you ever get challenged. So um, with that, I, I don't know if Lori or Chong, you have anything else to, to say on that subject, but um, it does like we're bumping up right at the end. <laughs> a 
Lori, <clears throat> John, any oh, final okay. comments, or do you, do you wish to take any of the uh, any additional questions? I think we're um, nicely set at the end of the program. Um, maybe this is a good time to now turn to some questions, or um, just time permit. Sure, go ahead. Have you have you been able to look at some of the questions during the presentation that have been coming up? I'm happy to throw out a couple if you like. Sure. Let's there was. Go ahead. Go ahead, John. No, I think there was a question about the. Uh, uh, international implications of the antitrust laws, mm -hmm. right. uh, and I think there are a couple of points I want to make. There is is obviously, given the global economy and the fact that the U.S. Department of Justice and the FTC are not the only enforcement agencies, competition agencies, in the world. I think um, you know folks should be sensitive to the fact that yes, there are imp international implications and competition laws. Globally, um, you know the, the the ability to bring suit um, in the U.S. under the U.S. antitrust laws is, is governed by uh, the FTAIA, which is the Foreign Trade Antitrust Improvements Act, but it requires you know effects in the U.S. market. Um, but in, in the the agencies that enforce the EU uh, DG Comp uh, in in Asia, for example, the KFTC, JFTC, uh, even MOFCOM in China, I mean, there's increased scrutiny and at times more aggressive enforcement activity um, uh, across the world and especially in the cartel area. Uh, and so that's something that um, companies that do business globally need to be mindful of. And Chong, I think um, when you, you mentioned earlier um, resale price maintenance post legion that's another area that's uh it's a good example for companies that you know we, we got rid of the the per se illegality of um minimal resale price maintenance and but that doesn't change the fact that there are other jurisdictions that still um treat that as per se illegal and it becomes a very big challenge in an antitrust compliance program to have different standards for different regions um so i think that's another great example of uh an area where international law creates uh, some some compliance challenges. I, and I think you're both right. That's certainly um, something that DuPont, as a multinational company, needs to keep in mind. Um, and um, realizing that they're operating in multi multiple jurisdictions. Um, and you know, I think we've even seen cases not too long ago where, um, generally speaking, where um, evidence has been permitted to be brought in. Um, from foreign foreign jurisdictions or countries into um, cases pending in the U.S. Okay, and I think uh, I think you did cover this a bit, but is, is anything in particular that should be said to salespeople in training about uh, about prices and competitive prices? I know you did touch on some of this. Is, is there anything in particular you would say about the sales force of a company? Yeah, I think that goes to the comments we had in marketing and in regard to, um, you know, questioning whether price announcements need to be made publicly or if you could deliver letters directly to customers. Um, that might be uh, a potential way to go. And I, you know, yeah, in, in terms of sort of the practical advice, I mean, uh, you know, I would – in terms of the risk, and, and you know, sometimes you need to enforce some more discipline just to make sure that you're fully within the, the boundaries. Is uh, a general, uh, you know, rule might be, uh, depending on circumstances, is number one not to have salespeople solicit um, pricing information from competitors or or customers or other ones they deal with uh, that have obtained such documents. Uh, but also, um, you know, that obviously, you know, they should be, in addition to antitrust training, if they're, uh, you know, um, in a particular technical industry or et cetera, be given contemporaneous trade secret training as well. But um, I think part of the, um, the issue is just to be, you know, it's all, in, in a, as all lawyers will say, it depends. If it depends on the, the circumstance, the industry, et cetera. But that's something that you just need to be very careful about. And a bright line rule might be, uh, if it's appropriate in the particular industry, don't solicit or obtain or disseminate 
uh, pricing information. Uh, and it depends and, on and the to Go ahead, Lori. Sorry. Uh, John, to follow on what you said, I think that's absolutely right. I think um, another way is to turn the tables and ask the client, you know, how would you feel if your information was revealed um, by your uh, customer or client uh, to your competitor? Right. Well, and you know, part I mean, of it also is, is to guard against the risk of charges later on that potentially there's potential certainly. collusion, that certainly. somehow the sharing of information as in between competitor and competitor uh, is uh, collusive activities such that there's confidential information being shared and then suddenly there seems to be you know surprise surprise some sort of um, correlation in terms of the the pricing of, of the party so there's a variety of risks involved in in, in any sort of competitor competitor exchange of information great thanks uh, John we we will have to wrap up now so once again you've been listening to Lori Berdell uh, corporate counsel with DuPont Ty Carson with Krell and Mooring, and Chong Park with Steptoe. Thank you all for, for your excellent insights. Uh, on behalf of Lexus, thanks everybody for, for participating in this webinar. We ask that you please follow the link to the survey as your feedback on products and services is a great resource for LexisNexis. So thank you all for participating and have a great day.